James is a practical but provocative book of the Bible. Uh, I think there are three hooks, you could call them, uh, to hang some principles on in order to understand and apply the book of James well. The first of those hooks that I want to share with you this morning is James writes this letter as a guide for the Christian to understand what true and mature faith actually is. This is his main purpose. In fact, as you go through the book, you'll see this, the tests of Christian faith, the tests of true faith. That's the first hook. You have to understand James in that perspective. The second hook is this. James is very illustrative and proverbial, but he's not exhaustive in his teaching. Now, what do we mean by that? James gives many different colorful illustrations and applications, but he doesn't give all the possible illustrations or applications that could come from a text. For example, James will focus in heavily on the use of the tongue, on the words that we speak all through the book of James. Now there is no way in which we would be able to say that the only thing that matters is one's use of the tongue. James instead wants us to see the big principle, the major principle, the general idea through the application and then, then apply it in other ways as well. So he's illustrative and proverbial. So one of the goals when you study the book of James is always be asking, what's the general idea? What's the main principle here? Not just what's the specific application. And third, and this is one that I think is very important hook to hang our thinking on, especially in light of the last two verses we read this morning. James communicates truth to the Christian community, to the church. But he communicates that truth on the individual level. What do I mean by this? It's important when we get to the social concerns that James speak about. He'll speak of poverty. He'll speak of caring for widows and the issues with orphans. He'll speak very practically. It's important we understand, though, that he's speaking to the church on the individual level. In other words, we read it, we ought not say, well, what program does the church have for caring for widows? What program does the church have for the orphans? What program does the church have for the poor? That's fine, but that's not what James is getting at. He's getting at, we ought to be saying, no, not what program does the church have, but what do I do individually and personally? How am I living out my faith? It's spoken to the congregation on the individual's level. We see that when he speaks of the tests of Christian faith and obedience. If you're reading James and you're constantly thinking then, well, this is what the church ought to do rather than this is what I ought to do, you're reading it incorrectly. It's meant to be for the individual to take heed to, for the, the personal sense. Uh, this is true and it, it really helps us understand the issue of social concerns. Just because something is a Christian duty, caring for widows and orphans, for example, who get today, today does not automatically make it a congregation-wide duty. Um, or even the main mission of the church. James, though, when we look at these three hooks, we kind of hang it here, we understand James is primarily concerned with the life, duty, and obedience of the individual Christian as he or she lives out the faith that he or she professes. James is concerned with the obedience of the individual Christian as we live out the faith we profess. I've been tasked with teaching the end of James chapter one without the benefit of providing the contextual backdrop in the rest of the chapter of James. However, Josh and Caleb, uh, Josh back in May and Caleb these last two weeks did well in not only teaching their respective texts, but in setting the table for me to finish the chapter today and to sum up what is being said in chapter one of James. Um, Think back with me to what you have heard and read last week specifically. God gives fantastic gifts to his children. In fact, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God, right? Specifically, 
The greatest gift that God has given is that of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. Or as was explained last week, this is the regeneration of the Christian. God made us born again. Why did he do this? Why did he give us life through the word of truth, through the word of God? He did so that we could be a sort of first fruits of his creation, right? So we can be those who reflect the creator in all of his awesome moral and holiness. We're made to reflect God. Now we were made to reflect God in our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the beautiful garden. But you know what happened, that Adam and Eve disobeyed They sinned, they destroyed, they fought against the image of God. They disobeyed what he had made them for, plunging us all in them as guilty into that same condemnation. Thus, God, in order to make us able to reflect his moral attributes, he births us again, he regenerates us, he makes us new creation. And the text is fascinating because James says, what was the means by which he used to make you a new creation? He used the word of truth. He used the word of truth. Now that's just a euphemism for the scripture, the Bible. God's word. He uses his word to make sinners saints. That's a fantastic gift then, isn't it? that he would not only make you a believer, a saint, a holy one, a new creation, it's miraculous, but that he would do so with the means of his own holy word. He speaks you in new life into you. It's fantastic. So as was applied last week, verse 21, so receive with meekness the implanted word. So, so what do you do with it? And it's the illustration. Remember the illustration you heard last week? You've been given breath of life through the word in saving your soul. Keep breathing that same word, that same gospel. Fill your spiritual lungs moment after moment with that which has saved your soul. Keep breathing it in and out. That's what he's saying in verse 21. Lay aside everything that's not God's word and grab everything that is and take it in and eat of it and drink of it and breathe it in. It will cause you to grow and mature in the faith you have been given. And this is James leading to his main practical applications of the whole text. It will give you then this faith. You need the word. You needed the word to be born again. And you need the word to grow in that faith to mature. Without the word, you will not grow. Just as without the word, you would never have been born. It's essential to eternal life. It's essential to knowing God. It's essential to spiritual life, the spiritual word. So receive it. Humility, meekness, take it. Humble yourself. Love it. But notice that he's not done, and this is the text that we're at today. Notice in verse 22, he says receive it in verse 21, but then 22 he says, but, and that's not an adversial conjunction, meaning on the other hand, it's now, in addition, not, not on contrast, but in addition, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now be doers of it. You see the progression. You've been born by the word, receive the word, do the word what James is saying here. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. John 14, 15, Jesus is speaking. And he says this very powerful and yet very short phrase. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now Jesus is not saying that our love for him will grow as we keep his commandments. He doesn't say, love me by keeping my commandments Nor does he say that love comes from obedience. The more you obey, the more you'll start to love him. No, he's saying when you truly love me, you will have a natural inclination, even an unavoidable desire to keep my words. 
Those who love God obey God, and those who are disobedient to God's word simply are disobedient because they do not love him. And that's a hard truth to swallow, isn't it? Because we like to say that we love him when we're disobedient. But the reality is when we are disobedient, we are so because our love for God has diminished. That's why we're disobedient. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, he says. Just as Jesus was concerned that people not only hear his words, but that they follow him in love, doing his words, James, the brother of our Lord, has the same concern. That true faith in God will always result in active and humble obedience to God's words. Let me say that again, because I think it's very important we hear it. True faith in God will always result in active and humble obedience to God's words. This text that we're reading and we're going to study today, this is the point of it. But when you look at it, did you notice with me, it might seem that James is contradicting himself a little bit. Look at verse 19. In verse 19 of our text, he says what? He says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be Swift to hear. Swift to hear. Hear the word, right? And and as we understand what that text means, it says hear the word rather than fight against it, rather than strive against what it says. Hear it. But then in verse 22, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. So which is it, James? Am I supposed to be be swift to hear or, or not hear? Is he contradicting himself? Of course not. He's not being self-contradictory. You see, obedience to God requires first humble, receptive ears and hearts. But we must not stop with only hearing the word. We must go further in doing what the word has said. In other words, action must follow our hearing if it's considered to be true faith at all. Action follows hearing. But isn't that a strange phrase? Be a doer of the word. Have you ever thought of the strangeness of that? Like that's, it's actually an awkward way to say be obedient, isn't it? Be a doer of the word. Um, It sounds awkward in English and frankly, it's an awkward phrase in the original Greek as well. It's not very, it's never used anywhere else in the scripture besides James here. Um, he's, remember James is poetic and proverbial and illustrative and I think he's doing two things. He's, he's doing one thing, he's trying to compare two words and contrasting. He's using the verb doing and the verb hearing and contrasting. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer of the word. It's a poetic way of saying, be obedient, yes. But he's trying to point out a tremendously important truth. Really a dangerous truth. That it is possible that we could engage in something so noble, so beautiful, so necessary as to be hearing the very words of God. And friends, that is precisely what you are hearing today. Not because I am speaking them. I am nothing. But because they are coming from the inspired, infallible, um, inscripturated truth of God. These are the words of God. And we are hearing God speak to us. That's no small thing to hear God speak. But it is possible to hear God speak. It is possible to hear the words of God, to study the inspired revelation of God, to listen to riveting and passionate true exposition of holy words. It is possible to hear all these things. And because we are hearing God's word, to deceive ourselves into thinking that our faith is genuine simply because we listen well. That's what he says. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. What happens when one is only a hearer? He is deceiving yourselves. I'm well. It's well. It's good. I heard good words today. It's all good. There is a self-deception that is possible when we engage in even the most fundamental and profound truth of hearing from God. And there is no one who is immune to this self-deception. 
There is no one who is without this, who doesn't need this warning from God. I know that there is a trap on one side of the road, a ditch, if you will, where many think that by their doing of religious or charitable deeds, they can make themselves right with God. We've been looking at that in Galatians. It's a trap. It's deception that you think you can do something in order to be right with God or to impress God. And there's great doers out there because they have fallen into that trap. But James is concerned, and so our concern this morning in the text of Scripture is the other side of the road, the ditch on this side, where there is a self-deceiving trap, where many can think they can hear the Word of God, they can go to church, they can listen to sermons on the internet, they can pick it up and they can read their Bible dutifully, but it does nothing in or through them. That's a trap as well. And that is a danger that James is concerned about. Now, Jesus used a lot of parables to teach truth. And so does James. So he uses the parable. We call this parable the man in the mirror to illustrate this, this truth and this danger here and how one gets into this trap. Like all parables, it's not spiritual allegory. We're not meant to find hidden meanings, but a brief illustration drawn from normal life of spiritual eternal truth. The parable of the man in the mirror, though it does need to be read and understood in light of how the first century would have, would have read it. Uh, when we think of mirrors, we think of Roman or glass. Um, Roman glass used uh, as mirrors came later than when this text was written. So what James is probably referring to um, was highly polished bronze. That's what they would use prior to using glass mirrors, a highly polished bronze. Sometimes even silver or gold that was highly polished. It's reflective, but not as perfectly reflective as our glass mirrors today. So James says that one who is content to hear the word of God, but reluctant to do the word of God, reluctant to do anything with it, he is like one man a man who looks into a mirror, and he's saying that one who is concerned about doing and being obedient, he's like another man who looks into something else, kind of like a mirror. And so it's this parable of these two men, the man in the mirror, and what he's looking into. And the first man is described as one who looks into this mirror, this highly polished brass, and it says in our text, uh, he observes his natural face, He observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He does see himself, but when he departs, he forgets what he saw. In the parable, James doesn't seem to indicate that the man doesn't care about what he saw. It doesn't say anything that he he didn't care about, it was no big deal. He saw. The emphasis is that he observes himself and forgets. He may actually care very deeply about what he sees. It's not that he has not observed his natural face or original face is what that literally means. It's not that the polished bronze mirror was unavailable to him. It was there for him to look all along. He's been given everything he needs to change. But for some reason, he's uninterested in doing anything about what he sees. Now it's interesting, when James moves to the second part of the parable, he steps out of the parable. He's no longer telling a story. He doesn't use the figure of speech of mirror anymore. He just now goes straight to the moral of the story. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he says, the perfect law of liberty, or the law that liberates, that is the gospel, the word of God. And he's contrasting these two individuals. Both are looking into the word of God. Both are seeing something in the Word of God and both are responding to the Word of God. There's actually two contrasts that James brings up that I think are very instructive in, to teach us how we are to approach the Word of God or perhaps I should say how we ought not approach the Word of God. The first contrast is the contrast of the men looking into the mirrors themselves. Notice this. The first one, did you see what it says about him? He observes himself. He observes himself. The man's concerned with hearing. He's faithful in attendance to the worship services perhaps, or he reads his Bible. 
Contrast that with the man who looks into the perfect law of liberty. One observes himself, one looks into the perfect law of liberty. They're both looking into the word of God, but one is looking and observing himself, the other is looking and what he sees is God's liberating law. James is first contrasting the perspectives of the hearer and the doer as it relates to God's word. See, the hearer listens. He hears because he likes what it says about himself. Perhaps those parts he doesn't like, what it says about himself, he skims over, removes, or reinterprets. When he sees the word, he looks and sees himself. His end is to hear it, to hear himself. And he slaps himself on the back and he departs. Having seen himself, he's satisfied to move on to other things in life. There's not much sense in looking any further. I've seen what I need to see. I've heard what I need to hear. That preacher has spoken good truth because I agree with it and I can go on with my life. I've got other things to do today. But you notice the contrast. When James writes of the second man, the doer of the word, there is nothing about himself in the parable at all. In fact, it says that when he looks at the word, he disappears and what emerges is simply this. This is the perfect law of liberty. It's a very rare phrase used to describe the word of God, but it's fantastic. God's law that frees. Now, we know that James can mean nothing else other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, that which frees the sinner. And while the proud hearer looks for himself, the humble doer can see nothing but the gospel when he counters the word. This is very instructive for myself, and I hope for you as well, because it does show they're not looking at something different, right? Right? They're looking at the word of God. But their perspectives are quite different according to the contrast. What captivates you in the word? What do you see when you see the word of God? What do you expect when you come to hear the preaching of God's word? What do you anticipate? What do you long for? To hear a good word to get you through the week. Maybe something that could cheer you up a little bit. Feeling kind of down. Maybe something because you know that you had a conflict with this person and they really, you need, you need some ammo. You need something to argue for. When you encounter the word of God, what do you see it as? You know what James describes the doer of the word seeing the word of God as? The perfect law of liberty. He's enamored with the freedom that the word brings. He's enamored with the gospel. The good news that this word liberates me. It frees me. It saves me. That's the first contrast, but actually the more profound or significant contrast is actually in the men's responses. The hearer only, he, as it says, immediately forgets. While the doer, it says, continues in it. And then he's noted, not a forgetful hearer. Why does the hearer forget? Is it, it is not, I believe, forgetting in the sense of one who is ignorant or unintelligent. You know, just, oh, I'm just an absent-minded person. No, it's not the idea of a forgetful person. No, the fact that he immediately forgets is evidence that it really only captured his attention momentarily because he saw no lasting value in it. He saw no lasting value. He forget. What do you do when there is something that, that happens that you see no lasting value in it? You immediately forget and you move on to something else. He sees no lasting. Why does he see no lasting value in it? I believe it's because he doesn't see it as the perfect law of liberty because he observes himself because he sees it's really about me. What, what can this do for me? It's not real. I don't need it. This, is, this sermon's not for me. It's for someone else. I'm going to move on. This text, I, I need to find something else. He, he merely forgets. He, no value to him. It's something he reads on Sunday. 
something he pulls out when he starts going through a rough patch in life, a sharp tool to be used when he sees those around him get out of line, but it isn't the liberating word of God to him. Certainly he may say it is, but his immediate forgetting is clear that it has little priority to him. Now while the first man is observing himself and smiling and perhaps noting what a good sermon that was, then leaving self-assured because the preacher told him truth he already knew anyway, the second man cannot take his eyes away from the liberating law of God. In fact, the, verbs, the verb that we simply translate look in verse 25, um, in the English you just can't see it, but it's actually a unique word, this verb is. It means to stoop down and to intently gaze into. Perhaps that comes from the fact that in the polished bronze mirrors, they would often put them down and they'd have to bend over to look into it. But if you look at every lexicon that speaks of this word, it speaks of the idea of one who's stooping over, who's bending over, who's putting his face into it. I think that's contrasting the one who's observing himself and the one who's putting his face into it. Another aspect of this verb is the idea that it's intentional. He's intent in it. It captures his attention. Furthermore, the text goes on to say, and he continues in the word. The same word continue there is the word abide. John, 5, John 14, 15, abide in me. Abide, that word abiding. Um, some translations translate it, he perseveres in it. He endures in it. He continues in it. And you see this, remember James is quite illustrative and he paints pictures. He's painting this picture of a man who he's, he's come to the word of God and maybe he's heard it with his ears or he's looking at it with his eyes and suddenly the things that God is telling him, the things in this book, the, the, the words, the truths, they've captured him. It's the law that frees me. And so he stoops and he looks at it and he thinks of it and he meditates on it and he abides in it and he continues in it and he perseveres in it. He's not going to give it up. He's going to understand it. He's going to study it. He's never going to let it go. And so after the sermon, perhaps he goes and he thinks about it all afternoon and he, he meditates on it. And then on Monday, he, he's, God has spoken. He's spoken. I've got to see what he says. And he opens it up again on Monday and he looks in it. And then when he can't, even perhaps a lunch break or, or a time. He's like, I've got the word of God. I've got to find these things. I've got to see it again. Or as David put it, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation both day and night. I can't stop. It's life to me. It's life. Or as, or as Peter said when Jesus was speaking and he said, will you also leave me? And Peter says, to whom shall we go because you have the words of life. The words of God are the words of life to this second man. And so he stoops and he puts his face in it and he can't get enough of it and he perseveres in it and he abides in it. That's why he doesn't forget it. It's priority to him because in its pages, true freedom is found. In its word, in its truth, the glorious hope of eternity is seen. <coughs> In its divine revelation, we see the true nature of the holy God and the grace and mercy of that same holy God to liberate us. We can't get enough of it. reason the first man forgets what he's heard while the second continues is precisely because of each one's perspective with the same word. One comes, observes himself. The other comes and stoops and intently sees this as the perfect law of liberty. Freedom is found here and he continues in it. He abides in it. You see, when we see the word as a resource for us to simply help or charm us, we forget it when something more helpful we might think comes along. We're merely hearers and our faith is untrue, but when we see the word as the source of all life and eternal freedom, we persevere and we abide in it through the good and the bad, the loss and the gain, the blessing and the lack of blessing. But ultimately, the one who sees the word of God as the source of all life. 
He is blessed in all he does. What does this mean, he is blessed? It doesn't mean that everything he does, like King Midas, he touches it, turns to gold. It it actually means that he is the truly happy man. (laughs) He is the man that has true joy because his joy has found the source of all life. And in this he rejoices and he is blessed because he has found life. I cannot ever, when I think of this idea of one finding life, I, I always go back to the, the, the book written by John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. And when Pilgrim, as he was called at the time, before he came to uh, lose the burden of his sin at the cross, uh, when he was in the city of destruction and the evangelist comes to him and tells him, you must flee the city of destruction. Flee the, flee the destruction to come. Flee death. And he reads the words of the scroll, which is the word of God. And it's a burning in him. He understands the truth of it. But all of his friends and his family are calling at him to stay, to don't leave, to don't leave. And, and he must do something. The, the John Bunyan tells it this way. He says that he put his fingers in his ears and he runs out of the city crying out, life, life, eternal life. He's found the source of life and nothing else matters when that is found. Have you found the source of life? Have you been brought forth by the word of truth? Has God saved your soul by showing you the the cross of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb? And if so, that source of your eternal life is still the source of your sanctifying life. It is the gospel, the law that liberates. Perspectives. So, this fantastic parable of the man in the mirror following the command, be a doer of the word and not a hearer. James actually outlines it quite clearly. The command, be a doer. And then here's the parable illustrating that, what that looks like. It's one who sees the word as life. Now, he practically applies it in, an illustra- in, a, in a very illustrative application, one specific one, verses 26 and 27. Here, Obey, and then here's the motive in response. But here are three practical implications. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the sermon, if you can, with me, please. Remember these hooks, uh, those ways we have to think of James? They come into play here. First, by noting, this is not an exhaustive application. This is not the only way that true religion is found or true devotion is. It's, it's one specific application. Now, I believe James is pointing out um, a very important and really first application, but it's one. There, there are possible other applications. What's the principle then here is what we ought to be thinking. What's the principle? So that's one of the first things. The second thing is remembering he's appealing to the individual. He's not appealing to the church corporate in a programmatic sense. I know this or I understand this because remember when Paul, the apostle, writes about the church as a congregation, the church corporate, their responsibility to widows, it sounds quite different from James. Because when Paul writes about it, he talks quite restrictive. He have to be 60 years old. They need to have raised godly children. They need to have served the saints. Then the church will care for those widows as a whole. But James is saying just no restriction, all widows. <laughs> He's talking about the individual level here. The individual. What you and I do as doers of the word. Now he says this interesting phrase as he applies it in verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, why would one, according to the context, think he is religious. Now I know some translations say seems to be, but I think the best rendering of this is that he thinks in himself to be religious. Why would one think in himself to be religious? Well, the context tells us why. Well, he he receives the word. He hears it. He, He looks in the mirror. I mean, he's doing all the right things. He's hearing all the right words. He puts his nicer clothes on and he comes to church. He does what he needs to do. He thinks he is religious. It's the one who thinks he is religious is the same one 
who observes his natural face in a mirror and immediately forgets. It's the same person he's talking about here. And conversely, the one whose religion is described in verse 27 as pure and undefiled before God, this one is the same one back in verse 25 who intently looks into the perfect law of liberty. So he's fleshing out the parable. There's two individuals in the parable, the one who looks and observes himself and forgets and the one who peers into the law of liberty and continues, just like there is the one who is, thinks he's religious and the one who truly is religious in James's use of the word. Now, I better point out the use of this word religion here. It isn't a common use of the word in, of the Christian faith in the New Testament, but that is what it means. In fact, the word is, simply means devoted. Right? The one who thinks he has true devotion. The one who thinks he's doing well. James seems to think that the control of one's tongue, that is how one communicates with others, reveals an awful lot about one's heart in relationship with God. I, I say this because it's all over through the book of James. James 1.19, text from last week, brought this to the forefront. How one responds to the word of truth. The ability to shut up and listen to God's word rather than to hastily respond with proud notions or angry words is an important mark that we have been regenerated by the word of truth. Then in James chapter 3, he devotes an entire chapter to the use of this, what he calls bridling the tongue, controlling what and how we speak to others. So it doesn't surprise me that James, when he wishes to apply the first evidence of one who humbly receives the word of God and is not just a hearer but a doer, he comes back to the tongue, the words, the responses. Last week, you visited all sorts of proverbs that speak of the wisdom of bridling the tongue, so I'll revisit those. But I will note that we live in a culture today that has turned the notion of wisdom and leadership on its head. The man who can best another bully, berate his opposition, and give a savage burn to the one who disagrees with him. They're the ones we put up here as leaders. But James doesn't. God doesn't. James, following the words and example of Jesus Christ, shows us something clearly countercultural. The religious man, that man that, that is devoted to hearing and doing the word of truth, he shuts his mouth more than he opens it. And he puts a bridle on his tongue and hears and does rather than spits and spouts. Some say that the eyes are the window to the soul. Jesus says the tongue is the revealer of the heart. And James follows suit by pointing out that the man who fills his ears with the sound of his own voice easily deceives his own heart. Deceiving his heart to believe that his wranglings about the law, his debates, his strong words of dissent are evidence of spiritual superiority, true devotion, religion. But the opposite is the painful truth. That one who speaks so boldly, so arrogantly, so proudly about his religion is the one who, as the text has said, lives in a useless religion. There's no value to it. He's actually deceived his own heart. But... The man who truly is devoted, who's a doer of the word, a hearer than a doer and not a hearer only, one who is intent in God's revelation, one who's looking in this perfect law of liberty and stooping down and humbly receiving and doing this implanted word. His devotion is seen in that he holds his tongue, but not only that he holds his tongue, but in that he does that which reflects God himself, the God he has learned about in the word. Because he goes on and says, but pure and undefiled religion before God. The man who spouts before men has not considered what he is before God. But God sees and God knows. 
And the one that would say they have pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. And isn't this fascinating? To take care of little old widows and to take care of the orphan, the one whose father's abandoned them, mother's gone. I mean, James is building of this man up who's intenting God's word, who's stooping and seeing the liberated word of God and one who abides in it and continues in it. And then he doesn't follow it up with saying, and this man, this man with pure devotion to God, he stands before thousands and proclaims the word. He stands before, before hundreds and he teaches truth. Remember, James isn't applying everything. Those are good. But it's somewhat, a, a little bit of a, a, of a letdown, you could say. The one who is truly devoted, he's the one who has sold all his goods and he's traveled to the farthest reaches of the world to proclaim the gospel and to stand behind pulpit. No, he doesn't say that. Who is the religious one? Who is the devoted one? Who's the one who's in the word of God? Who's the one who knows God's word? It's the one who sees the powerless and the weak and the oppressed and they take care of them. It's the one who does the things that aren't done behind the pulpit but they're things that are done as it gets on the level of a child and cares for the orphan. This is pure religion. This is undefiled religion before God. This shows whether one has truly received the word as a doer or as merely a hearer of the word. Remember, the principle is what we are to be concerned with. It's not just caring for widows and orphans. There's more to it than that. In fact, why does he express the caring of orphan and widows? By the way, the word visit there literally means to, to provide for. It doesn't mean to stop by and have a cup of tea. It means to provide uh, physically and financially for, to take care of, to bring them into your own home. Why does he, why does he speak in this way? Why does he speak of this high and noble pursuit of doing the revelation of God as as applied primarily in keeping your mouth shut and taking care of some widows and orphans? Why does he do this? Well, historically or culturally, we understand that in that day, widows and orphans had no recourse. There were not government programs to care for them. There was nothing for them. They would die if they were not cared for by someone else. And so the principle he's speaking is not just the widows and orphans. We'd be, I think, wrong to only apply it there. We have to apply the principle. He's speaking of the powerless and the weak and those unable to care for themselves. The man whose religion is useless, though his mouth is tireless, is contrasted with the man whose tongue is bridled and by selfless acts he shows himself truly devoted before God. See, this man has seen the liberating effects of the word of truth, the gospel. It's what he continues in and so he bridles his tongue, shuts his mouth, finds himself more concerned with others' troubles than and his own sin. Funny how we often are more concerned with others' sins and our own troubles. This man not only cares for the fatherless and widow, not only cares for the, the, the powerless, but then notice that it says at the end, and keeps himself unspotted from the world. Isn't it interesting how we are more concerned often with keeping others unspotted and providing for our own troubles? But here's a man who is concerned with his sin. He weeps over his sin. He's concerned with his temptation. He he's wants to be unspotted. He doesn't want to sin. He doesn't want to fall. He doesn't want to, to live a, a godless life. But when he looks up and he sees others, he, he sees what they need and he seeks to care for them. This is a man with true faith. James' point is this. True faith is seen when we care for those who are forgotten, marginalized, oppressed, and helpless. The theologian Theodore Epps says this, 
This means doing something for those who cannot return the favor. If we express concern only for those who are able to reciprocate, we are not loving as Christ loved. Tell us how deep your faith is. Tell us how strong your stand for righteousness is. Tell us how many hours you read your Bible, how many sermons you listen to every week. I suppose verbally battle those who have not achieved your level level of biblical intellect and Bible memory. But I'm sorry, all that says little or anything about your faith in the one true God and the gospel. Show me your perspective on the word. Can you get enough of it? Are you stooping and continually in it? Does it? Do you abide in the word? I mean, can you, can you shut your mouth and hear it in your heart? Furthermore, does it cause you to weep and mourn for your sin, your unspottedness, your, sorry, your spottedness? Does your time in the Word urge you to keep yourself, not others, but yourself unspotted from the world? Yet even more, does your devotion urge you to care for the oppressed, the marginalized, the helpless, the widows, the orphans, those who cannot help you? As I come to the conclusion of this text, I cannot help but think of Jesus at his death on the cross. Jesus bridled his tongue When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He bridled his tongue. Though he had every right to fight his oppressors, he was right, they were wrong. He bridled his tongue. Jesus Christ, to the very end, kept himself unspotted from the world. He was the spotless Lamb of God. But have you ever noticed in that account of Jesus' death on the cross that at one point he simply pauses in his suffering And he turns to his best friend. And he turns to his mother. His widowed mother. And he says to John, take care of her. Take care of her. John, Mary, new mother and son. There are seven things that we have recorded that Jesus said from the cross. And one of those seven has to do with this text right here. With Jesus caring for the widow. Friends, this is Christ-like. This is God-like. What does your faith do?